The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. The rich man said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Two weeks ago, we gathered here and we talked about things we have lost. Anyone lose anything over these past two weeks since we've been together? Good, good. So you may remember, if you were here, that that two weeks ago we heard um, a story of two of Jesus' parables. One of the, the parable of the lost sheep, where the shepherd runs off to find the one lost sheep leaving the 99 behind. And the parable of the lost coin, where this woman unravels her house to find that one coin that she has lost. And in both those parables, once the lost item was found, the owner rejoiced. And so as we explored that parable, I talked about some of the items that I had lost. And I think that resonated with you, because since then, many of you came to me and told me about the things that you have lost, some of them temporarily, some of them permanently, I think it struck a chord with you because we have all lost something and we've struggled with how to find it. If only we had a way that we could get, I don't know, this this bird's eye view of the whole scenario, of the whole place where we've gone so we can kind of see where we go, have been, and follow our steps and and maybe see where we've left it. Because how many times have you walked right past the thing you were looking for? It was right here but you were focused somewhere else. I mean, those kinds of situations show us that we need to take this opportunity to stop and and look up and get a bigger picture of what's around us. It may not always work. We may not always find what we're looking for, but it gives us a better chance of doing so. I wonder what that would look like as we come to worship. You know, instead of showing up here and thinking, I wonder what I'm going to get out of worship today. But rather entering this building and being able to look around. To see the faces of family and friends and strangers sitting around you. To hear and listen to stories of what happened this week. Whether stories of joy, stories of hope, maybe frustration and loss. Asking questions. Stepping back to 
listen to the music, to listen to the, uh, our prayers, to hear Jesus' words in the gospel spoken to us, to hear the joy and voices of, of all God's children. And then remembering about this worship that occurs all across this world that we share in. What would it be like to take a step back and see what that looks like for us in worship? To see God working among us. It's really incredible the things that can happen and the visions we can have when we can step back and take, get a bigger picture of what's going on. And I say that because I think that's what happened in the gospel today. Today, as you know, we've heard about this rich man who lives this lavish and luxurious life, all while a poor beggar lived suffering at his gate. You know, from the tone of the story, it sounded as though this rich man passed by this beggar every time he left or returned home, so much so that that man knew the poor man by name, Lazarus. And just remember, that's, this is a different Lazarus than the brother of Mary and Martha, whom Jesus raised from the dead later. This Lazarus was in desperate need of, well, I mean, just about anything and everything. He was so hungry that even the crumbs that fell from the table of the rich man's table would have satisfied him. He was so covered in sores that being licked by the neighborhood dogs was a relief to him. And yet, day after day, this rich man just walked right past him. Now, given what we've been discussing here, maybe the rich man was so focused on this lavish life, lifestyle of his that he didn't even notice Lazarus lying there. Maybe that could have been his excuse, but it's still just an excuse. I mean, had this rich man opened his eyes a little bit or taken a step back to see what was going on around him, he might have actually recognized the need that was literally right in front of his eyes. I mean, the rich man was certainly in a position to, where he could have helped Lazarus even just a little bit. Because what, what did Jesus say that one time? When you did it to the least of these, you did it to me? Something. But anyway, excuse or not, when the day of judgment came for both of these individuals, we heard what happened, right? Right? Lazarus, the poor man, was carried away by angels to rest with Father Abraham, while the rich man, who is never given a name in this parable, was buried and goes to Hades. And as we heard, this rich man finally had that opportunity to see that big picture of what was going on. Right? We heard that. And it said, in Hades, where he was being tormented, the rich man looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Abraham then comments about this great chasm that's been fixed between the two of them. And suddenly, with the new vantage point that he has, this rich man sees the big picture. And what's he say? Uh-oh. That didn't end well. But again, it took that change, that major change in perspective for him to even get a glimpse of what was happening. And once the rich man had that change in perspective, he wanted to prevent what was happening to him from happening to his family. He begs Abraham to have Lazarus rise from the dead and, and go and warn his family about the fate of his, their rich brother. But Abraham says, no, they should have listened already to Moses and the prophets. But the rich man keeps pleading, and, and he says that, that by seeing Lazarus, that will convince them. That's got to be the thing. But Abraham says, no, if Moses and the prophets, literally the entire story of God, has not opened their eyes, then neither will seeing someone being raised from the dead change their mind. He said that, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. I wonder what that line could mean for us in our understanding of Jesus' resurrection. But that's a whole other sermon. Today, I wonder what big picture each of us might be missing in our day-to-day -day lives. In what ways have we been so focused or had that tunnel vision on one certain thing that we've missed something lying right at our feet? 
It happens to me every day at home. I'm focused on something, I'm walking around the house, and somehow I step on a toy. Every day. Glad it's not a Lego. But how many times have you, you know, driven down the same road and never noticed some little roadside attraction until that one day that for some reason traffic was backed up and you actually had to stop and you got the chance to look around? Amazing what you can see. Or how many times have you been in the heat of an argument and said something that, oh, maybe you shouldn't have or did say something that you should have? Have you ever tried, when things get heated, to step away, to take a breath and try again? By doing that, you're able to get out of the moment, think about that big picture, and come back with a different outlook. I'm sure it's never happened to you, but if you have a project and rep or a repair or something, and, and you, it gets, you, know, you can't figure it out, you start getting frustrated, again, I can't picture any of you doing that, have you ever, what do you do? You walk away, right? You say, I got to walk away from this. And you get a whole new perspective on something so that you can come back and see the bigger picture. I think this happens when people go on mission trips. It's some sort of phenomenon that I know you've heard of. Someone will go off on a mission trip thinking that they're going to be doing all this good for so many other people. They're going to save people. They're going to tell all of these people about Jesus but when they come home, they talk about how that trip changed themselves because suddenly they've been able to listen to other people's stories and get this whole new outlook on life. You know, what could change if we took a moment now and then to take a step back, literally or figuratively, to get that new perspective and see a bigger picture? Do you think it could change the course of conversation about politics these days? Could it bring a, about a greater unity and purpose in our church and in the greater church? Could it actually change the way that we live? Could it allow us the bigger picture of what Paul described to us as the life that really is life? A life that where we know that we are loved and claimed and called by Jesus who truly can bring us immeasurable richness in this world. Amen.